Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Come Off Conqueror show. As you can see, I've got my beautiful guest, Nicole, with me again, and we haven't changed clothes because we're literally <laughs> 30 seconds after the last interview because we started chatting about um, one of the things that she brought up in her interview last week. And the more we talked about it, the more I was like, oh, man, we really need to talk about this. This is a suffer. I like how you said it, suffer in silence, suffer in secret thing. And more people do need to talk about this problem and talk about this issue. So what are we talking about, ladies? Before we jump in and I tell you what it is, hit the subscribe, like, share, do all that stuff so we can get these messages of hope out. Thank you so much for doing that. All right. So what is this suffer in secret thing that Nicole and I were discussing? We were talking about pornography. And if you remember last week or in the last interview or five minutes ago, for those of you who are binge watching these episodes, like I usually do, we were talking about her story of how she um, somehow got started on her pornography addiction at the age of 11. And it became such a problem in her life that by age 15, you had lost her virginity. Is that right? 15. Mm -hmm. And this led to issues in her marriage, in her first marriage. And, you know, it was a problem, kind of one of those underlying lining problems that just kind of, you know, does its damage kind of secretly and silently. As we were talking offline, um, I was asking her what she's done to overcome this addiction, because I think it is a hard one to break. For any of you who either suffer from it or know someone who has, you know that it is as addictive, if not more so than heroin and other drugs. It is a real problem. And I like what you said. You mentioned that you have a friend who's a therapist who doesn't think it's a problem, right? Yeah, yeah. And it is, okay? So let me t rattle off a few stats for you, y'all, okay? Pornography is at the root of so many sexual abuse, assault, and um, cases. Like if I remember going through... Um, a lot of different trainings for uh, domestic. Oh, sorry, got a shift here. Um, we did something at the gym, and my back is not like here. <laughs> All right, ADD moment. Back on focus, Bon. Um, so anyway, I remember going through a lot of DV domestic violence trainings, and it was really interesting to hear. And I don't know the stats off my head, but pornography was at the root of so many of these different abuse stories. And it is obviously a huge problem within the human trafficking world. It's a huge multi-billion dollar industry. It has gotten more and more sadistic and perverse over the years. Like it is absolutely disgusting how far down that rabbit hole goes to the depths of hell. It is so horrible um, that and I remember I just barely, not barely, like a year ago, we were working with a, a therapist who wrote a book. I'll link to it down below because as per usual, I don't remember the name, but it was by this guy, Dennis Parker, who he works with a lot of um, addicts, pornography addicts, and he has a ridiculously high um, recovery rate. Um it's like insanely high. It's amazing. I mean, he figured out the problem of why pornography is so addictive. And in his opinion, a lot of it has to do with the spirit and the spirits that it attracts and how, when you have this addiction, you are being literally attacked and attached by spirits who have passed on, who also had these addictions Ooh. and they can no longer satisfy these cravings, as you put it, um, because they no longer have a body. 
So they need to use you and your body to satisfy these addictions. Right. And what he's figured out is if you can sever the tie with these spirits, um, these lost souls, that you will be able to overcome your trauma much easier and your addiction much easier. It takes other steps to do that too. That's not the only step to do it, but that's one way. So Nicole, I'm um, sorry, I've been talking like nonstop. No, you're good. <laughs> when you, so for you personally, I know you didn't do that. I know you didn't go and work with a therapist, right? Like you mm-hmm. did this all on your own. So tell us how, um, I know it's not easy and, and stuff, but how are you overcoming this addiction and talk to us more about your personal walk here? Yeah. So let me preface this by saying, I am a very firm believer that there is absolutely no such thing as casual viewing when it comes to pornography. Hmm. Um, And it's not about if you come across it, it's when. So you need to have some sort of fail safe to get yourself out of that situation because I didn't. Um, I was really, really young and naive and I was 11 when I first started and I didn't have a Uh, open, candid conversation with anybody on what I would do when I encounter these images. These images stay with your brain forever. And um, pornography triggers the receptors in your brain, much like drugs do. And that's why it's so easy to become, uh, for it to become a habit and then an addiction. Um, For me, it was absolutely something that started habitually because I was seeking acceptance. Um, there's a small group of kids at the school where I went to, and it was very, the talk, the conversation was very sex forward. And, um, instead of feeling like I had the, uh, support and trust within my uh, familial relationships, I went to the internet to search out what these things were. Um, and some of these images stay with me, like, from when I was 11. So back up. So they were talking about things that you just didn't understand and you wanted to know what they meant. And instead of asking your parents, you went and researched it. Exactly. Parents, listen, did you hear that? Do we have the kind of relationship with our kids that our kids can come to us and ask us these kind of questions, man? And have we had these conversations with our kids already And we now know by statistics that kids um, are now viewing pornography or their first introduction is at the age of seven, seven y'all, not 11, like Nicole, which is still really young, but seven. And it's often on the playground. Yep. Playground. Yeah. Okay. Keep going with your story. I just had to interject. Sorry. (laughs) It's devastating. And. I think a lot of the issue is, and I I don't want to blame my parents because they did the absolute best they could and with what they had. And I have great parents. I really do. And I didn't Um, mean that blaming. I just mean like, we need to make sure. And I don't know. How do you even know if you have that kind of relationship? Because that is super awkward. Even even if you do have a good relationship with your kids. (laughs) Yeah. And I think part of the reason is, the older generations, like my grandparents and before, sex is taboo. That's just something you don't talk about, period. Right. And so that was a learned behavior by my parents from their parents. It's just something you don't talk about. And I've learned, at least for me and my personality, that is something I wish I would have had was a more open, candid conversation with my parents, my safe place. So I knew I could go talk to them about what I was hearing and, and, feel that I could trust them not to shame me about wanting to know. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of where it all started is I just felt ashamed that I didn't know what it was and that I wanted to know. And then once I saw it, I knew I wasn't supposed to see it. So then I just suppressed everything. Um, And this continued for years. Um, After I lost my virginity, I went through the whole repentance process with my bishop um, at church and I really did kind of have like a a renewed born again type of mentality to where pornography um, 
sex, masturbation, that world wasn't an, even an issue for me until I met my then husband, my first husband. Um, and so that was about two and a half, three years that it really was an issue for me. And it makes so much sense when you were talking before about how like these spirits, it, it's all about the spirits because I was in a really good place spiritually. I was in constant connection with my heavenly father praying. I was in my scriptures regularly. I was having these God conversations on a regular basis to where I was arming myself with his light and spirit and darkness cannot live where there is light. Light will dispel darkness. And, um, and I think that's kind of how I got back to where I am now. And I was telling you earlier, it's not something that completely goes away. I don't want to give that false um, pretense at all because much like with drug abusers, that addiction is always there. You just learn coping mechanisms to not use again. Right. And for me, when I am walking the path that I know my heavenly father wants me to walk, I am um, studying my scriptures and more in his gospel. When I'm having conversations like these, when I am in daily prayer and I've noticed that when I have an idle mind, when I am not doing something good. So yesterday I had a really bad day. I didn't feel good. I didn't have anything planned. So I laid in bed a lot. And these intrusive thoughts, these insecurities, these demons, my favorite sin, um, they creep up and the temptation is real and it's there. And it goes back to what we talked about in the last interview is that choice. I have to choose in that moment, what I'm going to do. Am I going to give in to that, um, that craving that lustful nature, or am I going to choose to get up, walk away and do something else? Am I going to choose to take um, advantage of those coping mechanisms that I've learned over the years? Um, and really for me, the the way that I have kind of, I won't even say overcome the addiction, but I'm overcoming the addiction mm-hmm. is with my savior. Um, knowing that by having conversations like these and being vulnerable and making these connections and helping other people, other women know that crap happens, but there's a way out of it. It helps me keep my nose clean, so to speak. Um, Because I want to be able to have the conversations from that spiritual standpoint of I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You can do it too, rather than I know all these things, but I'm still doing it, you know? Um, So I guess that's, I haven't really used any traditional, um, like I haven't used therapy or any other really resources other than my savior and the scriptures and prayer I lean on my husband a lot. Um, We have a very open channel of communication. He has struggled with the same thing for about as long as I have. Mm -hmm. And um, so we rely on each other a lot as kind of like our um, accountability partners. (laughs) And it really helps to have somebody in your life that you can be so candidly open with. where there's no shame, judgment, or condemnation attached. And it's it's just love and encouragement. I think that's really, really, really important. So if you're not the one with the addiction, if you're not the one with the issue, be the safe place for somebody else. You have no idea how much that helps. Hang on one sec. Hi. My little three-year-old just walked in. Aw. Hi. Hi, sweetheart. Are you not, okay? Do you want to sit on my lap for a minute while we finish our conversation? Okay, it's a little awkward to have this conversation with a three-year-old in prison, but <laughs> um, okay. Um, welcome to the show, Sophie. <laughs> <That's> my <laughs> little one. I think what I'm hearing from you is really great advice, though. Like, have a game plan when the craving comes or when the, um, known the temptations there and what's not unbuttoned my shirt. I'm not, I'm trying to put the 
It's the button in here. Oh, okay. You're trying to button it. Okay. That's different. Um, but having a game plan, I remember my, I did a, um, I was working with a friend of mine who started a company called Joytagious and it's a therapy kind of thing where you basically become your own therapist. Kind of, you're like, you mm-hmm. figure out where your triggers are and, um, what you need and to feel safe and to feel better. She has a scale of zero to seven. Zero is your lowest low. So for some people that might be suicidal thoughts and for other people that might just be a really crappy day. Um, and seven is that your highest high, it's absolute joy. And the idea is you kind of get to know where you are on that scale every day and throughout the day, and you develop skills and coping, safe coping mechanisms to help you go higher in this scale. Hmm. Um, It's really awesome. But her thing was identifying the very first step is identifying what throws you down. What is it in your life that makes you feel low? And it's that same kind of thing with an addiction. What sort of things trigger you to feel a temptation or feel craving for whatever addiction it might be, whether it's what we've been talking about or, you know, drugs or something. And um, I think it's really interesting to know yourself in that way. And then the next step is to have a plan for what are you going to do when that happens? You know, so she had this, like, um, I can't remember what she called it, a, um, a hope box, a, um, healing box. Gosh, I am totally forgetting, but essentially it's a box, literally a, like a shoe box or something that has in it. Um, yeah, it is Kate. Hey, I am talking right now. Can you, can we snuggle? Come here. All right. Um, we inside of it have different things that help you feel safe and help you feel happy. So Mm -hmm. When you're at a at a zero, you can't talk yourself out. There's no logic there, right? Like all your all rational thought is out the window when you're at a zero. Same with an addiction craving. A lot of times, it's really hard to be rational in those moments. So what do you got to do? You got to give yourself comfort in that moment, right? It's what you're looking for is comfort because a lot of times with an addiction. You're seeking to solve and to help yourself feel better about something. And your addiction is your way of coping. So instead, what's a different thing that brings you comfort in that moment, right? And that's in your box or on your playlist. Like maybe it's a song or maybe it's a conference talk or your favorite pastor's sermon, right? Like just different things that bring you comfort in that moment and help you come back to present, And then you can then work on working your way up, up the scale. And so I think you're, you're spot on with having a plan and next having an accountability partner, having someone that you can talk to is a key to stay right with stay um, clean. And I think we were talking offline. I mentioned, I do not have this particular addiction, but I do have an addictive personality And so for me, I have figured out that because of how highly addictive this is, I have guardrails up that are so far in that are kind of ridiculous. Like if I watch a TV show that is what um, we would have normally in in the old days called soft pornography, but now it's just normal um, TV viewing it's so crazy how like it's just degraded, isn't it? Disgusting, yeah. It really is so crazy how low our standards have gone. But um, if I go, if I see something like that, I immediately have to turn it off because I know myself. I will justify the show and say, oh, it's got a really great storyline. That was the first time they'd ever shown anything like that. The next three episodes don't. So it's okay to watch. Like I will justify the heck out of stuff. Mm-hmm. I am a justifier. Like I love chocolate and I will justify me drink my, me eating the entire tub without any like issues. Right. Like that's, <laughs> I know myself well enough to know <laughs> that I will go there. And so, and I also know myself well enough to know that if I let myself have just one bite of chocolate, I'll eat the entire bar. Right. So the best thing for me is if I really want to lose that weight is not to even have a chocolate bar in my house. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. Like the guardrails with this, like 
where are your guardrails and where are you going to put up those protective barriers? Yeah. And I think the same goes for our children and having, I think I really appreciate that you said, I'm so sorry, you guys, this is just real life. My cute little three-year-old is making noise and I'm so sorry. Um, but the, I don't know where the key is, honey. Um, but having, I like that you said we come from a generation where our parents, like this was taboo to talk about and we have to be the chain bakers there and make it not taboo. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to link to some resources down below everybody for how to talk to your kids about pornography and how to talk to them about drugs and how to talk to them about staying safe around strangers so that they don't get themselves in a situation where they are an ex accidentally molested, things like that. Like, how do you have these hard, awkward, difficult conversations? I'm going to link below to some videos that are really great resources um, for how to have those conversations. But you hit it on the, on the nail, like on the head, you hit it on the head. We are supposed to teach our kids. How are they going to know? Yeah. They're going to, if they are not getting the info from us, they're going to get it from their friends. Yep. And if they're not getting it from their friends, they're going to get it from social media and TikTok. And I sure as heck don't want that to be the resource that my kids go to. No. So, um, I do know that there are, let's say you who listener who's, who's listening, there are some resources that if you are struggling with this addiction, um, I'm going to post links down below. There are some resources that can help you um, with overcoming it and finding strength and finding tools, finding a therapist who um, isn't place fair about it um, would probably help. I still can't believe that therapist said that to you, especially since all the evidence says the contrary. <laughs> it is like, yeah. Big problem. I just can't believe. Oh my gosh. Especially after being diagnosed in the same sentence as a love and sex addict. Uh, but pornography isn't an issue. Yeah. It, that was the first and last time I'd ever had a therapist conversation with that person. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So find a therapist that works for you with you. Yes. And that won't shame you, right? We don't want to be shamed, but, um, I do know that Dennis Parker, he does take, um, clients from all over the world. Like he does zoom. If you want to do zoom with him, he's a hypnotherapist. So it's a little bit different type of therapy. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's great. There's, you mentioned an Instagram account. That sounds like it'd be pretty supportive. What's it called again? Fight the new drug. Um, they have, merch porn kills trust porn kills love fight the new drug it's really neat it's really cool well do you know I, i'm gonna look it up i wonder if their site has any resources too i know the church that we belong to has a ton of resources out there and support groups and things like that um, i know that there's other churches that do so i'll link um i'll do some more research and put all that stuff down below and by the time this video airs we'll have a little more um support for you. But I also want to invite you to join our support group. Okay. Um, we have a Facebook support group that is still pretty small and intimate. Um, so you can feel pretty safe in there to share your questions and stuff. And we can talk about this. We can have an open discussion. It is a judgment-free zone. There are no uh, taboo subjects in that group. We can talk about it all. Um, and if you feel like you want to have a safe place and a safe person to reach out to, please, please join our group. So the link is also down below. Nicole, any other um, thoughts on this that you feel like would be helpful for someone who's going through this in the moment? It's easy to get caught up in the shame and guilt of, of suffering in secret. As I like, I like how you put it, suffering in secret. Um, because if we can be more transparent, more vulnerable about the things that we're going through, specifically with pornography, we'll realize that more people are struggling with it than what we think. And there is power in numbers. Um, when you shine light on your demons, they can't survive. Um, so choose 
despite your shame and guilt, choose to bring it to light. Um, that's the first step in moving forward and away from it. Your last video has a an amazing testimony of the atonement and of forgiveness. Um, at the sake of having you repeat yourself, do you mind <laughs> sharing um, sharing your testimony of why? Sorry, I'm going to get emotional here. Ladies, God loves you. He doesn't want you to be shaming yourself. He doesn't want you to be suffering in darkness. He doesn't want you to be suffering in secret because that's where Satan lives. That's where the darkness is. And that's not where you're going to find your healing. So Nicole, will you share your testimony of the redemptive power that you have experienced? Absolutely. Um, I know that my savior hasn't left my side, even in the moments of my mistakes and my missteps and my reroutes. Um, he is there. Um, he loves me and it's a judgment free zone with him. Um, we just have to come to him and through him, there is so much love and so much peace. Um, I just, I, it's really hard for me to speak on the atonement of Jesus Christ because it is something so sacred to me and I don't always know how to put it into words. It's something that you feel more than you see. Um, but lean into your savior. He has experienced temptation. He has experienced loss. He has experienced abuse and trials. He knows how to perfectly take care of you and help you away from these demons and insecurities. Lean into him and start seeing yourself through heaven's eyes and realize your worth, um, your divine, your divine being having an earthly experience, not the other way around. And in our savior, in Jesus, there is so much healing. Um, I believe that I've felt that so many times. Oh, amen. Amen, sister. <laughs> and you can have it. You can have this feeling that she is she is talking about. Like, we all make mistakes. I've made some big doozies. You know, maybe pornography wasn't mine, but I've had other things. And I can tell you from experience that when you, when you turn around, and you see the Lord's face, it's not a face of disappointment. It's a face of love and compassion. And I promise you that you will see miracles happen in your life when you let him in. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing this and for being willing again to share and talk about something that's, you know, a little taboo in our culture, but it's so needed to talk about. And I really appreciate you being on the show and I appreciate all of you guys for watching and for commenting. And if there's anybody that we can help, please let us know, reach out. Um, you don't have to suffer alone. You don't. No. Come be a part of our group and let us support you and let us love on you and show you just how amazing you are. I get kind of annoying in that way, don't I, Nicole? Like I just keep <laughs> posting all of these. You're great. You're great. You're amazing. You're beautiful. But I do it in hopes that someday someone's going to be start believing it and <laughs> start seeing the post and go, she's right. <laughs> Instead of, oh man, here he goes again. But I love you. I truly do. Love you. And I love all of you guys for watching who are sitting on the sidelines. Come hang out with us. Come be a part. Okay. Thanks below. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. It'll be a different person this time. Maybe. <laughs> I can't. No promises. We'll see. <laughs> Bye, guys.